there's a saying in the the tax world that says pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered mm. right so you you could you could be a pig make sure you you know what i'm saying you can get fat off some of these deductions you start writing things off you know what i'm saying don't you don't have to be you don't need to be stingy with it you know what i mean so like you don't it, it's it's there for you to be able to to write off because the irs wants to incentivize you to be a business owner right because they believe that business owners they provide jobs they provide opportunities they create commerce people are spending money so they want to incentivize you but you don't want to be a hog to where you're just like yo because i have a business i'm gonna do i'm gonna just run it up right i'm gonna start popping bottles <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take first class everything i'm gonna, I'm gonna go crazy with it you know what i mean so you What's happening, good people? Welcome to another edition of First Generation Wealth Builders, man. Today, I got a special guest. It's very unique guest, too, you know what I mean? But I think that this podcast is going to be very informational for uh, investors, young business people um, like myself. So, I got Michelle. How do you say your last name? Val Brun. Val Brun. I didn't want to mess that up, man. You're Welcome, good, man. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for having me. Nah, no, doubt, no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Um, just to give uh, people a... Uh, a little bit of backstory on us. Um, we met at a mastermind. Uh, was that in February or early March? I know it's early this year, but yes. Yeah, some, yeah, some yeah. In Miami yeah. Uh, with Neil Maya. Yeah. Um, basically, uh, we didn't really get to talk too much until we got uh, on the bus. You know what I mean? That's why I learned that you were a CPA. Um, but I was following you before then. And uh, you know what I'm saying? I was just like, man. This man puts out heat when it comes to like information <laughs> on IG as far as like, you know, business strategies, tax strategies, uh, how to leverage and things of that nature, man. So um, I thought it was pretty cool and I thought it was a must to bring you on, man, to um, just really have conversations about some of your posts some of, and everything that you do, man. And I appreciate it. It's an honor. I'm super excited to to share information and just always dropping gems. So no, I love to do this stuff. No, no doubt. So to get started with started where, where you from yeah i'm originally from south florida okay. so i was born in miami uh parents came from haiti so okay. you know my mom and dad both came from haiti to the united states really to give my my family my sisters and i an opportunity to be able to live the american dream and then you know spent the majority of my life in south florida went to the university of florida for school got my undergrad degree in, in accounting and kind of that's where i started off and then later ventured out over to to atlanta georgia Got you, got you, got you. So we both got a. Uh, so I'm from Panama. I'm Hispanic. Okay. You know, so my first language is Spanish. Uh, but I was born there, lived there for eight years, came here in 1990 or Indiana in 1990. So we kind of like we we coming from different places and coming yeah. here together, boss. <laughs> I didn't um, even know that you were uh, came from war from yeah. Panama. That's that's interesting. It's very beneficial when you're looking for the amigos to help you with some projects. Yeah. You know, in my neck of the woods. <laughs> Um, but let's get straight to it, man. Um, you literally just taught me something. Um, we were talking about a situation, uh -huh. and you was just like, hey, he's an accountant, but he's not a CPA. Right. And a lot of us have the notion that when somebody says they're an accountant, they are a CPA. Can you break that down? Yeah, no, that's that's one of the, the big misconceptions out there about accountants. Everyone thinks that all accountants are the same, or everyone or all tax preparers are the same. But, you know, as Meek Mill says... <laughs> there's levels to this, right? Mm. And I don't mean that in a root or condescending way, but basically, as it relates to the accounting profession, you have all these different types of professionals. You got tax preparers, you got bookkeepers, you got enrolled agents, you got CPAs, you got tax attorneys, you got all these different types of individuals, right? So as, a, as far as accountants go, so you have, let's just start off with one of the level one, right? So you have tax preparers and you have bookkeepers. In order to be a tax preparer, you don't necessarily need to, to go to school having a background in accounting. Like even if you look at like the H and R Block website, they have a lot of tax preparers. Mm -hmm. One of the requirements in order to work at H and R Block is that you just need to be 18 years and older. You don't need a GED. You, you don't need a high school degree. You just need to be able to take their income tax course. If they like you, then you'll be able to work with them. And these individuals do your taxes for you, right? Mm -hmm. But again, you don't have to go to school. So if you wanted to tomorrow tell people like, yo, I'm doing your taxes, you can do that, right? So that's 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 tax preparers. Then you have bookkeepers. Bookkeepers are people who could do your accounting for you, usually in QuickBooks. They organize your transactions for you. Again, you don't need a degree in order Got to you. do that. 
And then you have accountants. Typically, when someone says they're an accountant, that means they have an undergraduate degree in accounting. So they went to school probably for four years and basically went to school for accounting. Understood. Then you have another level above that as it relates in the tax world, you have what are called enrolled agents. So enrolled agents are individuals who took a three-part exam with the IRS in order to understand the tax code. And with enrolled agents, they know a lot about taxes, but with enrolled agents, you don't necessarily need to go to school to be an enrolled agent. That's the enrolled agents. And then another level above that is certified public accountants, CPAs. Mm. Now, in order to be a CPA, you need you typically need to have 150 credit hours. 150 credit hours usually comes out to like having a bachelor's, having a master's. Right. The undergraduate degree has to be in, in accounting. Then you have to work under a CPA for a year. And then, and they have to sign off and say like, you did good work. And then you have to, part, even before that, you also have to pass a four part exam with the, to, to be able to pass the CPA exam. And that has le less than a 50% passing rate. Mm. And the interesting thing with CPAs is only two, less than 2% of the CPAs in the country are black. So like the fact that, you know, you know, if you come across a black CPA, it's very rare because the majority of CPAs are of other races. But, you know, there's definitely different tiers, different levels to it. Um, but the CPA is the highest of the highest as far as, like, education, background, the requirements in order to meet that. Man, you teaching me. It sounds like <laughs> you just... It sounds like you just told me how to become a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> there's... And then... And the interesting thing, what I also say share, share is this, too. Even as a CPA... That's still not enough for a lot of business owners and investors. And this is this is going to be extremely key, too. So a lot of times people hire CPAs and they think, yo, I'm good because that's a CPA. You went right. to school, you have the highest degree. Da, 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 da. It's still not enough because the thing about it is, from my experience, when I went to school, looking at the CPA exam, it's really geared towards having you work in corporate America. Right. Mm. So they're not really teaching you all the different nuances about taxes as it relates to business, small businesses, right? It's more related to on the corporate side. Same thing with investors. They don't really get too deep into like real estate investing, stocks, et cetera, right? So there's an, another level, right, that I call the tax elite, okay. right? Okay. So this is not something you could look up in Google, but tax elite are the individuals that you need to be considering in order to work with as it relates to working with you as far as taxes are concerned or just accounting in general, right? So the first part of that elite is education. So did this individual go to school for accounting? Did they go to school for tax? If they did, that's a plus sign. You can check that off. And and elite is an acronym, by the way. So I'm breaking down E-L-I-T-E. -E. Understood. The next part of that is L, legal representation. So can they represent you in front of the IRS? So enrolled agents could represent you in front of the IRS. CPAs have the authority to represent you in front I of the didn't IRS. Know that. Yep. Accountants, people who just go to school for accounting, just have the bachelor's degree. They can't do that. They don't have the authority to do that because it's just a a, a, a certain level of expectation that the, the IRS has in order for you to represent people. The next part of that is I, integrity. So integrity really relates to are they doing things legally and ethically? You know, Are they telling you to do, do things that you shouldn't be doing? telling you to claim kids you don't have, all this other kind of stuff, right? So you want to make sure you rock with someone who's doing things with integrity. Then the T comes with training. So training is basically, do they, are they constantly being trained? Do they, do, are they, do, are they required to be trained? Are they keeping up with the latest and greatest tax information, right? There's about to be a whole bunch of changes as it relates to the tax code with Joe Biden. He's looking to make some significant changes next year. Are they keeping up to that? So that's one of the requirements as far as CPAs and enrolled agents, we have basically what are called continuing education credits in order to maintain our license. Right. Accountants, if you went to school for accounting, there's no requirement to, gotcha. you're to maintain. Pretty much done there. Yeah, you're pretty much done. You get the, the you get the degree, boom, you're good. And then the last part of that is experience. So how much experience does that individual have? So how long have they been in the industry, right? So I've been in the industry for over ten years now. And also too, you want to also understand the the industry experience as well, right? So do they have experience working with real estate investors? Do they have experience working with your particular type of industry? Because there's different nuances, right? The tax code, there's over 74,000 pages in the tax code. So working with the individual who has a lot of experience or is maybe focused on that niche 
is going to be most beneficial for you. But yeah, that's that's the tax elite. But yeah, there's Ooh, there's <laughs> that was a mouthful. That was a mouthful. But yeah, don't don't. A lot of people get it twisted. Unfortunately, they think that if you, they hear the accountant, oh, it's it's the same thing. But it's 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 different. Got you. Different levels and qualifications to it. So as an investor out there, what type of services should we obtain? From an accountant, because there's so much. You talk about bookkeeping. Um, there's just so many different things. So what type of services should we acquire as investors? You know, let's just say we're doing fix and flips. What what should I go to my accountant and say that I need from him? Right. So that that that's going to be key. So really, as it relates to that, and this is another thing that the tax elite do, is they do a service called tax planning. All right, so tax planning is looking at your life, looking at your business, looking at the regulatory requirements and identifying and showing you ways for you to legally and ethically proactively save money on taxes, right? Because there's a concept called tax avoidance and there's tax evasion. Tax avoidance is legal. Basically, tax avoidance is looking at the tax code and finding ways that you don't have to pay more money than you need to on taxes. Okay. Tax evasion is when you're pretty much lying, right? So <laughs> you're pretty much, you, you capping, right? So you're saying like, yo, I'm not... I, I'm making less money than I actually am or I, I'm, make, I'm spending more money than I actually am. So one of the things that you want to look at as an investor is, yeah, are you working with an individual, right? One, making sure that you work with that tax elite that I mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. That meet, the, meet those qualifications. That's going to give you a better chance of having a positive experience working with that individual. So um, tax elite, and then you also want to make sure they're doing tax planning as well, right? So looking, showing you how to proactively save money on taxes. Are they telling you about the 1031 exchanges? Are they telling you that Joe Biden's looking to probably reduce some of that benefit? Are they telling you about cost segregation and a whole bunch of other benefits as far as being depreciation? How can you accelerate some of that depreciation as an investor? So those kind of things. So before you go too far, that's a mouthful. I'm 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 going to change directions on you. Go ahead. 1031 exchange. Yes. Can you define what that is? Yeah. So the 1031 exchange is essentially a section in the IRS tax code that allows you to be able to defer your taxes as it relates to um, property, right? So basically, let's say you purchase a property for 100000 You go ahead and sell that property for 300000 right? The difference between that 300000 and that 100000 is a $200,000 difference. Right. That $200,000 is going to be taxed at a, at a capital gain, right, if you hold on to it for more than a year. So one of the things that you could do with that 1031 exchange is you could actually defer some of that gain by reinvesting those proceeds into an equal or greater value type property, pretty much like a like or similar type of property, right? So there's there's timing things that you need to consider. You also need to work with an intermediary. So basically, it's something that you got to do beforehand. You got to pre-plan it. You co- consult with the intermediary. You tell them you you go ahead and when you make the when you go ahead and sell on the property. They hold on to the money. You identify the property. They go ahead and put that money into that property. And um, then you're able to go ahead and defer. And you can pretty much do it until forever, right? But one of the things that's coming up now with Joe Biden, Joe Biden's looking to reduce some of that benefit. So basically, he's saying that, you know, with the 1031 exchange, I think he's looking to reduce some of that benefit over 500000 So if that gains over 500000 then you don't necessarily you don't you you pretty much have to pay taxes on it. Ooh. So what I heard you say was this. I got a flip. I bought it for a hundred thousand dollars. Now I sold it for three hundred thousand dollars, so I made two hundred thousand dollars. Yep. I basically find a company that could put my money in an escrow account. Mm-hmm. And then I identify that hey, with that two hundred thousand dollars, I want to use it for a down payment on these three houses. And so um, within a time frame that they give me, right. I can now take that $200,000 and put it as deposits on three other houses and not pay taxes. Defer taxes. Okay. Meaning that you don't have to pay taxes that year. Understood. Right? And you just keep doing that until you you stop doing that 10 30 Understood. Exchange. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay. And then it's really that, it's not the 200000 because you're really getting 300000 That The, the 200000 is that gain. So it's going to be the 300000 that you're giving to them just to... Just to make sure we're all clear on uh, that. Hey, yeah, nah, yeah, nah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what we got you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get me together. <laughs> Get me together. Okay, okay. No, you got all right. It. And so, uh, also, um, are you familiar with the 27 and a half rule? So the, the depreciation? With, the, with residential property? Mm-hmm. Yep. Could you talk about that? Yep. Yeah. So, as it relates to, to real estate, you have 
there's two main categories of real estate, right? So you have residential property and you have commercial property. With residential property, you have to depreciate and basically depreciation is you writing off an asset over whatever whatever time period the IRS allows you to do. With residential property, basically property that you're using for, for tenants, et cetera, whatever the case is, you could write that off over 27.5 years. Commercial property is a little bit different. Now with commercial property, you have to write that off over 39 years, right? So one of the one of the things that you could do or look into as an investor is there's a there's a section in the IRS tax call called cost segregation. So one of the things that you could do is you can hire if the property usually if the property weight is cost more than five hundred thousand, you could hire like an engineering company or there's different companies that specialize in this. But they identify different asset classes within the, the unit, right? So they're looking at kitchen fixtures, they're looking at the carpet, they're looking at different components of it, and then they're identifying different asset classes and different uh, depreciation schedules for those, and that allows you to be able to take advantage of even more write-offs of that year. So you get an even bigger depreciation. So, you know, to basically the way it breaks down math wise is that instead of having a, let's say let's say you they they identify a carpet and they say you can write it off over 7 years mm-hmm. if we're using that 27.5 you're really without that you're really writing off that carpet over and let's say the carpet is $1000 or whatever the case mm-hmm. is if you're using that 27.5 you would have to you only you're only able to claim uh 1,000 divided by 27.5 for the year, but now with now that you're calling it and saying that you can write off over seven years, you could do that a lot more quickly. Got you, got you. Understood, understood. <laughs> now, there's a lot of people getting into the Airbnbs. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, uh, as an investor, I, I wholesale, I flip, and I rent. But I like my favorite niche is to buy and hold, just because I'm doing it for the long run. It's my retirement sure. plan. I flip because I might acquire a property as a lead that it just requires that I flip it. It's not a rental. It's not rental material. It might be too expensive. Mm-hmm. And then wholesales. Let's say I'm kind of busy. Like right now, I'm overwhelmed. Any properties I get, I just you know send it to the next person. How should I set my companies up? Should I have it to where they're all under one umbrella, meaning St. Castro Investment Group, or should I have St. Castro Investment Rentals, St. Castro Investment Flips? And St. Castle Investment Airbnb. What's the best way for me to do that? Yeah, so it's it's gonna depend on a lot of factors, but I'll give you some general guidance. And that's a very important question. I think uh, a topic that's not talked about or explained enough. So basically, as it relates to taxes, the IRS breaks income down into different categories, right? The two main categories with this topic I'm gonna focus on is active income and passive income, all right? Two different ways that you're taxing those, two different tax forms that you're using completely separate. So as it relates to active income, in the real estate world, you're gonna have fix and flips. Fix and flips meaning that you're selling the property in less than a year usually. Wholesaling, right, which is something that you're usually doing kind of quick, less than a year Mm -hmm. type of situation. Rehabs, similar to fix and flips, right? Mm -hmm. That's gonna be considered active income. When you are dealing with active income, then you can go ahead, and this is pretty much across the board with a lot of businesses, you can go ahead and create an LLC, right? A limited liability company. Limited liability company, one of the benefits of it is that it gives you uh, legal protection in the event that you get sued, right? So let's say you have a tenant, they get upset with you, whatever, they try to come sue you, they can only come and liquidate the money that's within that account, right? If they happen to win that case. They can't come after your personal assets, your personal assets being your bank account, your car, your house, those kind of things, right? So you want to make sure that you either put the these those types of that type of business into an LLC, right? You'll also have the option to do a corporation, but generally speaking, for most people, LLC is going to be the, the easiest thing for you to do. Then, at, because it's active income, you can also, and one of the benefits of the LLC is you can actually make an election. What's called a you can elect to be taxed as an S corporation or a C corporation. The default setting for LLC, if you're an individual, is gonna be a sole proprietorship. So now you have the ability to be able to make what's called an S corp election or a C corp election. Uh, With the the S corp election, one of the benefits of it is that you're able to save on self-employment tax, 
right? So one of the things that happens with LLC sole proprietorships is that you have to pay self-employment tax, which is 15.3%. Okay. 15.3% is FICA. So FICA is basically Social Security and Medicare, right? So, you know, like, let's say you're working a nine to five. Usually what happens is you as an employee pay 7.65%. The employer pays 7.65%. As as an individual or as someone who owns a business, you're essentially the employee and the employer. So they're making you pay 15.3% on the profit of the business, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the benefits of switching over to an S corporation is that you're able to save on that self-employment tax, but one of the requirements is that you need to have or need to pay yourself what's called a reasonable compensation or a salary. So with that, instead of having a 15.3 hit the profit of the business, it's now hitting the salary of the business. So let's say, you know, your business makes uh, seventy-five thousand dollars in profit. Instead of having to pay fifteen point three on that, which comes out to about what, like thirteen thousand, whatever the case is, you go ahead and make that S corp election seventy-five thousand, same same income. But then let's say you pay yourself thirty-seven five hundred. Now you're paying about six thousand dollars in taxes, right? So, or $5,000, $6,000, whatever the math comes out to, so that's the $6,000 savings right there. And the numbers get bigger as you make more. So generally speaking, I tend to let my clients know it's, it's good to consider making that S-Corp election if you're making more than $50,000 in profit. If you're making less than that, it's not going to help you much. You know what I mean? You might end, actually might end up paying more because mm. there's more requirements. You got to have a more expensive tax return, bookkeeping, et cetera, right? That is on the fix, fix and flips, rehabs, wholesaling side of the real estate world. Then you have the passive side, right, which is what you're into, right, long term, buying holds, et cetera. That is passive income in the IRS's eyes. <clears throat> With that, you can just put that into an LLC and you don't have to necessarily put make any uh, tax classifications or whatever the case is, right? Because generally with those, that's gonna be on that Schedule E, all right? So that you're not paying a self-employment tax on passive income because you're not, it's just passive. It's not, you're not, you're not working for that income. So that's gotcha. that's how you need to consider it as far as real estate. And then as far as, you know, how, how many LLCs you wanna have or whatever the case is, sometimes people say that it makes sense to have an LLC for each property, maybe just one LLC for multiple properties. Generally what I do and it, it's really on a case by case basis because one of the things is if you have multiple LLCs, you're gonna have multiple tax returns or tax Man, forms. It's right? a headache. Yeah. So you can. So there's some states that allow you to do what's called a series LLC, where you have basically one LLC and have a whole bunch of properties in there. That's a whole other topic for another day. But um, with if you want to consider having multiple LLCs, you just need to look at your risk, right? Because if you have, if you have, let's say you have. Depending, maybe depending, you you want to look at how much money you have into in, in that business. So maybe it may make sense to separate it if you're doing like maybe having an LLC for your residential properties and then another LLC for your commercial properties. Or you could do it to where maybe you have a separate LLC for the different states that you have the properties in. Right. So there's different ways to do it. Generally speaking, that's more of a, a conversation that you want to have with like a, a tax attorney okay. or a lawyer, because that's more of like. When we talk about LLCs and corporations and stuff like that, that's those are what's considered legal entities. From a tax perspective, it's not going to make any difference. Actually, having an LLC, multiple LLCs, whether you have one LLC, multiple LLCs, it's not going to make a difference tax-wise. Gotcha. So that's because you have what are called tax entities. So this is what I do. I basically got uh, about two dozen rentals. Okay. Um, and so I have one LLC uh -huh. um, for the dozen rentals, but each property ha is under a trust. Mm, okay. Therefore, that if I do get sued, it's just under that trust. Right. And the other ones are protected because they're an individual trust. Got you. That's okay. the strategy that my tax attorney gave me okay. to, to use. That is, that can, do you know if it's a revocable trust or irrevocable trust? I want to say revocable. Okay. It probably, I mean, revocables are easier to deal with because you can you can change it over your life. Um, yeah, and I, I mean. and I And I do tweak it. Okay. Because you know, here and there, I change it, and it's still there, and I can put a new property in it. You know what I mean, and stuff like that. Okay. As far as as far as legal protection, I'm not sure if it's. I think they could still 
penetrate it mm. with the, if if you if you have a revocable okay. um the irrevocable I gives you I think gives you a little bit more protection but again that's more I might like be wrong logo. but yeah, but yeah, I yeah, have yeah. a trust per each property though okay so I don't know which one but you know give or take I just wanted to, you didn't mention that so I wanted to kind of get that yeah, example yeah, yeah. You know no no I mean? no that's good yeah yeah so basically with with all of these entities right you want to make sure you everything fo- flows through a trust so the way I usually do it and draw it out is you have your active income on this side you have your passive income on this side and everything needs to be flowing down into a trust mm. so that's what it and if you guys if, uh, basically what a trust is what a trust allows you to do is just pretty much a directive so in the in the event that you become in the event that you die or become incapacitated then the trust will give that directive like okay who's getting these assets where's where's this money going whatever the case is because if you don't have the trust in place what's going to end up happening is that it's going to go up for probate mm-hmm. and when it goes up for probate you know people some i, I have a estate planning turn just like probate's the ghetto because basically you got people fighting they're arguing over the property they're saying that yo this is this is my he they wouldn't give this uh yeah. this property over to this individual because I they love me more whatever the case it, it, it becomes a hot mess and it starts to become public information too because now you got people that are out here you know what I'm saying who are, have access to that information now. now. I have a question to you: When you do have a trust, let's say you get locked up, uh huh. Like is this is this still active and good if it's cash flowing and then you come back to it? Yeah, so ba- all all the trust is is just uh it's 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 explaining. Well, usually with a trust, it comes with a will. Yep. And a trust also is like I said, pretty much a directive. So yeah, if 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 you get locked up, that's fine. It's just that's water. how the rappers be doing it. Right. They be going away for ten years and still come out like nothing ever happened because everything's in a trust. Right. Wow. 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 Got you. Got yep. you. Got you, man. All right. So, um, like back to it. If a young investor coming in the game, what services do they need from a, you know, CPA? Yep. Perfect. So tax planning, that's number one. Number two, bookkeeping, too. So bookkeeping is going to be key. You can do that with the CPA. You could just hire a bookkeeper as well. Bookkeeping is not a very, it's not a very difficult um, task to do. So the, the, you don't you don't necessarily need to work with CPA. But a lot of times CPAs, Either they'll do it themselves or they have people within their team that can do the bookkeeping. But you want to do bookkeeping. Bookkeeping is going to be important. Basically, what bookkeeping is is just recording your transactions, organizing it into different categories. So with bookkeeping, one, it's going to keep you accountable because when you're understanding you know, how your properties are cash flowing, what's going on with it, what expenses do you have, right? It's going to help you maintain and track your expenses. So one of the things with taxes is that you want to document your, document, your, document your expenses. So that's what bookkeeping helps you do. And then also, too, when it comes tax time, you're going to have your financial statements in place, your income statements, your balance sheet, et cetera, for tax, for tax purposes when you, when you need to go ahead and file your taxes. Got you, got you, got you. Now, let's talk about it. What is okay to write off and what's not? You know what I mean? I feel like people play with that. And you know what I mean? Like, you got to do it within reason, right? For sure. What What are some things that people take advantage of that they should not be writing off that could get them in trouble? Yeah, 100%. So even taking a step back and making sure we get the foundation on it, too. So basically what a tax write-off is, when people say tax write-offs, basically it's equivalent to like a tax deduction. So what happens is when it comes to tax time, you make money, right? So you're making money during the year, and then you have what are called deductions, tax write-offs, and these expenses could actually reduce how much money you pay in taxes, right? So let's say you make $100,000, you spend $70,000 on the business, then you have a $30,000 profit. $30,000 is, just to keep it super simple, that's what they're looking at in order to tax you. So say, okay, you you basically you made $30,000 in a year after all the expenses, and if your tax rate is thirty percent, then you pay nine thousand dollars in taxes. That's 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 that piece. As it relates to being a business owner, entrepreneur, the the IRS actually has requirements in order for you to be able to write things off, right? So there's four requirements that the IRS is is looking at generally, and then there's a whole bunch of other rules associated with it. But the four main requirements, and it's another acronym that I love using acronyms. So an, another acronym for it is what I call tax free deductions, right? So free is the acronym. The first part of that free is going to be that F, right? So the expense or deduction needs to be for your trade, business, or profession, all right? So basically, you want to look at your your business and see if the expense 
makes sense for that business, right? So I know you're in real estate, right? Mm-hmm. But there, in, in the past, right, you were in the beauty industry as well, right? right? Yes. So, so with that, it doesn't make sense for you to be able to write things. You, it doesn't make sense for you to write off hair products in the real estate business, right? Right, right, right. right. Because it needs to be for that trade, bi- for that trade business or profession, right? So that's one thing, and that's why it's important to also important for you for people to separate their LLCs depending on or separate their businesses depending on the business type, have their, their own accounting records, et cetera, whatever the case is, because it needs to make sense for that business. So it needs to be for your trade, business, or profession. The second part of that is R. So it needs to be considered regular for your business. The IRS calls that ordinary. So going back to that example that I shared with you, the expense needs to be ordinary for the for that business, for real estate, advertising, commissions, uh, cleaning, um, management fees, et cetera, those things are considered regular for that business, ordinary expenses. The third part of that is E, essential. All right, so essential, the IRS calls that necessary. So what's gonna be essential for you to operate that business, right? So in order for you to operate that business, you do have to pay property taxes, you do have to pay utilities, you have to pay other things that are essential for you to operate that business. And the last but not least, and this is a key part, kind of what you're alluding to is economical. Right, so economical, the IRS calls that not lavish or extravagant under the circumstances, meaning that you want to look at how much money you're making in that business, right? So if you're making, you know, a thousand dollars, and you know, I love to talk about riding off the G wagon. If you're making a thousand dollars, can't ride off the G wagon, right? right? right so right, you, right. It, it needs to make sense. You have to be making substantially more than that 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 expense amount for you for you to do it. But if you're a multimillionaire like Fifty Cent. He did an interview with Lil Wayne on Young Money Radio. He was like, yo, you know, last year, it came to the, towards the end of the year. I had this big tax bill. I needed to get it down. So what did I do? He bought five cars, right? 50 mm. Cent could do that because he's a rapper, entrepreneur, producer. He's multimillionaire, so he mm-hmm. could afford to do five cars, and it's not considered lavish or extravagant for him. Got you. You know what I'm saying? So you got to look at how much money you're making in your business. That's one of the factors they're looking at, right? Um, same thing with travel and all these other things that are, that you're doing with the business. It just can't be, you can't do it, over, you can't overdo it. There's a saying in the, the tax world that says pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered, mm. right? So you you could you could be a pig, make sure you, you know what I'm saying, you can get fat off some of these deductions, you start writing things off, you know what I'm saying? Don't You don't have to be, you don't need to be stingy with it, you know what I mean? So like, you don't. It, it's, it's there for you to be able to, to write off because the IRS wants to incentivize you to be a business owner, right? Because they believe that business owners, they provide jobs, they provide opportunities, they create commerce, people are spending money, so they want to incentivize you, but you don't want to be a hog to where you're just like, yo, because I have a business, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna just run it up, right? I'm gonna start popping bottles, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take first class everything, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go crazy with it, you know what I mean? So you just wanna kinda use some judgment, be reasonable, you know, it's always good to have a conversation with your CPA or someone that you're working with to sometimes run things by or whatever the case is, but yeah, that's those those are the four requirements. But to, so that was that's what we're looking at. So as it relates to real estate, like I said, some some expenses that you can consider some write offs is the advertising, right? So if you're advertising and promoting, it's like, hey, I got this unit available. Hey, I'm trying to sell this. Whatever the case is, those expenses, whether you're doing on Instagram, Facebook, Google Ads, whatever the case is, then you also have. You also have meals. I talked about meals, right? So one of the things with meals is that you could do is let's say you're having a meal with a prospective, a, a, a possible client or someone that you're looking to do business with. You guys are discussing business as it relates to your as it relates to your real estate. Then that could be an opportunity for you to be able to potentially write off. One of the things that they did this year is in, it used to be 50% deductible. Now they increased it to 100%. As they increased it to 100 uh, percent exactly, and that's and that's and and, and it's funny that you said that because that's what they want you to do. So the reason why they increased it is because due to COVID, the restaurant industry got hit hard. So just like, how do we get people back in there? And they understand that taxes mm. impacts influences decisions. So they're saying, okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna increase it 100. percent So now business owners are about to go crazy and just start doing a whole bunch of wow. just start doing a whole bunch of meals. Now, question for you: Let's say uh, somebody does meal prep, purchases uh-huh. meal prep. Does that could you write that off? No, not not what you're saying. Meal prep business or meal prep for yourself? Meal prep for myself. So like, if I as an entrepreneur, um, I don't like leaving my office. 
because um, I'm more productive there. So if I go get lunch, that's 20, 30 minutes, driving there, driving back, that's an hour that I've wasted that I could have been more productive, right? Mm -hmm. So to maximize my time, um, I may get meal prep. Right. Could I, could I use that to write off? No, you can't in that instance because the 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 with the meals if with business meals you need to be eating with someone. Understood. So you need to have you need to have a, a a meal with an individual. So if it's just yourself, that's pretty much like you're gonna do that anyways. You need to eat. You're a human, so they're they're not gonna give you that benefit. They're trying to incentivize you to make more money. Even though I feel you, that's the, that's one of the things like for you, it's gonna make you more productive because you're you're doing the meal prep. But they want to incentivize you to tr do business with someone else. So that's why they give you that incentive. Understood. Now, if you are one of the benefits of traveling is that if you are traveling, there's not that that requirement is now gone where you have to eat with someone. So if you're eating by yourself and you're traveling, then you're able to take you're able to write it off. Got you. How does one justify something like that? You know, what I mean, like our ask look at a year worth of receipts. Uh -huh. I got fifteen thousand dollars in meals. How can I justify? Eat? How, how can I prepare to justify the twenty thousand dollars? Because you know I'm not trying to like do anything in, unethical, but I feel like there's a gray line there, right? You know what I mean? For uh, sure. And I think that I could have went to Ruth Chris uh -huh. by myself, right? But you know, in essence, people write those off. So how do you justify that to to make sure that you don't get hit with any fines or any slap in the hands? Yeah, it's going back to that that economical piece. So you want to make sure that you are, you know, spending money economically, right? So do you really not say you can't go to Roof Chris, right? But they're gonna look at it and say, hey, look how much money is this business making? Are you making Roof Chris money? You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So like again, if you're making only thirty thousand dollars in your business and you hitting up Roof Chris on the reg, like you know what I'm saying, that's gonna look crazy, right? But if you maybe do it once a year, maybe. A few times they're not gonna go crazy, but one of the things is on top of that, when it comes to any of these expenses, documentation is key. So going back to the meals specifically, so one of the, some of the things that you need to be recording as it relates to the meals is you want to record the restaurant that you're going to. You want to document who you're eating the meal with because that's okay. one of the requirements. So you need to document the attendees. You want to document what you discussed. So you actually need to show, okay, hey, we discussed talking about this real estate deal here. We want to buy this building. We want to do this, da 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 da, da. You want to have that documented, some, just some real quick notes on that. You also want to document how much it costs. And then also, you know, and then also make sure you include the tips and everything because that's included as well. So those got are you. some things that you need to, okay. you need to make sure you're documenting. Got you, got you. One thing um, I was just thinking, and I didn't, uh, I, I apologize, one thing I got to answer on it, is Airbnb passive or active income? Ooh, that's the that's the question of the question of the day. Okay. So basically, as it relates to Airbnbs, the, currently the the guidance says that Airbnbs are considered short term rentals mm -hmm. um, because you have people coming in and out. They're not staying there for a long time. Short term rentals is usually if the average time that someone's staying in there is less than a week, that's going to be considered short term rentals. So, in the IRS's eyes, Airbnbs are generally considered passive. Okay, but there is an opportunity to be able to classify it as as active, but you have to demonstrate and show that it, it there's uh you're providing substantial services. Substantial services mean that you're pretty much treating it like a bread, bed of breakfast. Are you going back in there and cleaning the rooms every day? Are you treating it like a hotel? Are you providing breakfast for them? Are you pretty much providing concierge like a whole bunch of other services? If you're doing that then they may look at it as as active income. And if it's active, remember that you can also be able to have it or make what's called the S-Corp election by mm -hmm. filling out a form called 22553 during the year. Um, the, day, the, 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 the timely due date on that is, is in March, so you want to make sure you do it by March 15th. But anyways, to answer your question, generally speaking, that's going to be passive short-term rentals got you got you all right now um for entrepreneurs listening um i uh i pay taxes at the end of the year i don't pay taxes monthly um so the reason i don't though is because at her hair company i've had products so i could tell i could control my numbers a little bit better because i could expense it on material 
and roll it over into the next year. Right. Do do you recommend for people to pay quarterly or yearly on their taxes? Yeah. So the what the guidance says is if you make more than a thousand dollars in profit, you need to be making estimated payments on your taxes. Correct. So the estimated payments, those happen on a quarterly basis. So yeah, you want to make sure you're paying your taxes on a quarterly basis if you're going to make more than a thousand dollars in profit um, in your business. So yeah, the the what happens is if you pay it once a year, pay it at the end of the year. Then you can. This is when you can get hit with what's called um, an underpayment penalty. So mm. they actually give you a penalty for not paying the taxes during the year because they want their money. Not. I gotta talk to my guy. I'm yeah. paying penalties, huh? You probably you could you poss- possibly. So one of the ways to to not have to one of the ways to reduce your risk of paying the underpayment penalties is what's called a safe harbor rule, meaning that if you are paying. If you are about paying what you paid last year a little bit over than that, like 110% of what you paid last year um, during the year, then you're good. Gotcha. Um, so that that they kind of give you some grace there. It's like, okay, well, at least you gave us what you gave us. At least you, you were paying what you paid us last year. He has year. said that to me. So he was yeah, like, yeah. You, my number's been pretty pretty even the last okay, few yeah, years. Then, yeah, so you, so he was just like, good. we're good. But he said that, but I was just double checking with you, bro. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> make, sure, make sure my stuff was yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, No, you, you, he's, th- th- it sounds like that was some good advice there. So, yeah. What is something that most people uh, have a misconception about when it comes to taxes? You know, a mistake or something that a lot of people, you know, like they think that this is the way, but it's not the way. Right. I would say, so one thing is we talked about the different tax professionals. That's that's a huge one. Mm-hmm. That's like a that's a huge gem right there. So that's one um, understanding those requirements as far as it relates to taxes, the tax the um, tax free deductions or whatever. Understanding that economical pieces is is, is um is 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 important to understand. A huge misconception I would say in addition to that is. One of the things is most businesses are, well, I'll say this. So one mis- misconception is LLCs, right? So we talked about LLCs. With the LLC, it doesn't inherently have any tax implications. People freak out when I say this. Just because you have an LLC doesn't mean you're you're able to write things off. <laughs> Essentially, right? You, you, you can, but that's not what the LLC is designed to do. The LLC is a legal entity and you register that with the state. That's why, for tax purposes, LLCs are considered disregarded entities because we're just what the IRS is like. What what are these? What are, <laughs> it doesn't. We don't care whether you're LLC, whatever the case is. What we care about are the tax entities. So you could be taxed as a sole proprietorship, partnership, S corp, or C corp. Right. That's your tax entity. So the LLC, one of the be- benefits of it is you can decide how you're going to be taxed. But the LLC doesn't necessarily provide you any tax, be, extra tax benefits. It just provides you legal benefits, right? So that's I think that's one huge misconception that people don't don't get. It's very, it's very technical. It's very nuanced. But you know, I, I always like to make that distinction because a lot of people just just say, "Hey, get an LLC right and write right off your lifestyle." And I, it's like, uh, <laughs> understood, understood. Yeah. I'm gonna take you into a different tangent. You've been providing some great nuggets for us as investors. Sure. So uh, let's talk about, um, I uh, I don't know what it was worded, but I've been told before that I could pay my child um, a certain amount mm-hmm. to kind of use it as a deduction and to reduce my tax liability. Right. All right. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 another big that's another big one. So basically, one of the benefits of being a business owner is that you're able to pay your children through the business, right? So the way that works is this: if you have children, right, dependents that are under the age of eighteen, which means seventeen years and younger, then you're able to pay them through the business, and you're able to pay them through the business, like you said, take a tax deduction for the business, and then you and the child does not do not have to pay taxes on that income that you're paying them. But there's rules with that too. So basically the, some of the rules that you need to understand in order to be able to do this properly is one, it needs to be under the standard deduction amount, right? So the standard deduction amount for 2021 is 12,550. 
So if the amount is, if you're paying them less than 12,550, you're good on that mark. The next thing is they need to be doing, providing legitimate services for your business, right? So legitimate services for maybe your real estate business is maybe helping you clean uh, the, the unit, maybe promoting it on, advertise, uh, on social media. Kids are really good with social media, so maybe having them do that, video editing, whatever the case is, they need to provide legitimate services for your business. You should have a job description for them and and make sure you're documenting their hours as well too, right? And you wanna make sure you're paying them a reasonable amount too, right? So sometimes people try to push it and say like, yo, I'm, I'm, I'm about to pay my kid $100 an hour to clean my, clean my office, right? <laughs> that's, gotcha. that's, that's when you're pushing it, right? So you wanna make sure you're looking at what the market would pay for that particular service. So you wanna make sure you're paying them the market rate. Another thing that you want to make sure you're doing is that they have their own separate account. So the money needs to go from from your business account into their account. So they need to have a completely separate account from you and the business. Also, too, another thing that you want to consider is the IRS does not specifically have an age minimum in order to do this. But I tend to tell my clients that you want to consider doing this when the child is seven years old and older. So between the ages of seven and 17 is a safe range for me. The reason why I say seven is because at the age, because there was a court case. So basically there's a court case that, that, that where there is some parents paying their children and, and um, the IRS passed that. So they, 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 they won the case or whatever the case is. So because we're looking at, you know, that's another thing with the tax law, too, is like the IRS does leave it very open for your interpretation. But then the court cases pretty much set the president basically to share like, OK, this is this how, this is how it actually works in real life. Mm. So seven years is a, is a is a is a is a safe, a safer age to do it. Some people push it and do younger than that, calling their kids models or whatever the case is. You know, people do it. But I'm saying seven, seven, seventeen is a good age. And then also, too, with that, you want to make sure that with the with the child that you are that you're you're just making sure that you're you're documenting it and basically not calling it payroll. You can call it. Uh, there's different ways you can do it, but you can one of the ways you can do it is call it call it outside service labor. So they're providing that service. One of the nuances, though, I do want to share is that if they are. If you're an S corporation, it's not your. There's a little bit more uh, of a uh, structure that's involved in order to do that. So gotcha. you can't pay them directly through S corp. If you're LLC sole proprietorship, that's a lot easier. Got you, got you. All right, now, um, last but not least, um, like man, what do you do um, currently as far as like what what all services? I know you got a course, you got a book, right? Um, and you've been everywhere. What all do you do, like, you know what I'm saying, outside of just being like a CPA, taking care of clients? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? What other stuff you got going on out there, man? Yeah, man. For me, I so I have I have courses as you mentioned. So one of my one of my main courses, one of my best selling courses is called Tax Wealth One on One. So it's a course basically going through all of these different ways that you can save money on taxes. There's as it relates to taxes, there's actually six big ways to save money on taxes. Deductions, we talked a lot about deductions, retirement, insurance, legal loopholes, advanced planning strategies, legal entity structure. Talk about all of those in the course. So that's a really good course to check out. I also have a book called Prolific Profit, How Successful Businesses Maximize Profits Denominate the Market, inspired by the late and great Nipsey Hussle. Mm. So I got that out. That's pretty much going over everything accounting and taxes related, right? So it's just it's 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 very comprehensive. And you can see I'm pretty I'm not your traditional CPA, right? So I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking and talking. I'm, I'm speaking in a way that, you know, what I'm saying I try to make it simplified and try to break things down to the way the way we understand it, because this subject is not the sexy subject. Right. So that's why. And you've probably seen in my post. I try to keep it engaging, right? So I did a joint also called 10 Tax Commandments. So outside of me working with my clients, I also did, you know, a little rap joint, you know, yeah, inspired. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's the 10, 10 Tax Commandments. There what? it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So inspired by the late and great uh, B.I.G. I'm a big hip hop fan. Actually, uh, one of the fun fact about me is when I was growing up, I actually wanted to be a rapper for real, for real. So gotcha. um, 
I you see know, you had a, uh, I see you had a, like a little, uh, little party, a little sam- uh, a yeah, listening party, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, had, I threw a listening party for it. Yep. So I threw a listening party. Had people come out, listen to, the, listen to the record. I performed the record. So I, okay. I performed. I did the whole rap. Ten Task Commandments is also on YouTube. I did a whole music video for it. Shot okay. in Brooklyn, New York, in Bed Stuy. Yeah, I, I remember <laughs> seeing you. You even had the outfits and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah the bad no, boy I, joints. I, I, I represented. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely pulled. Pulled, pulled some old school looks. I had the bad boy jersey. I had the. I did a look from the hypnotized video. I did a look from with the, with uh, the in your hair. Yep, play, yeah, yeah, play yeah, yeah, in yeah. your ear. I did. Uh, what else did I do in that? I did. Uh, it wasn't from a music video, but it was from a photo where he was in front of his crib. So okay. I, I wore. I wore that outfit as well. Um, I wrapped in front of his mural. Like I, it was. I was. I, I was out here. But I, gotcha. I, it's. It's out there. It's on all streaming platforms. Even if you go. It's on Spotify, Apple Music. It's on YouTube. It's on World Star. Even if you go in, even if you go into your reels, you could actually look it up and use the the tracks from the songs. Gotcha. That's real. So it's it's, it's out there. That's but dope. Yeah, That's super yeah. dope. Hey, me and Jackson, we really ain't the biggest crowd, man. But I feel like we need to have go ahead and have a have a uh, a basement party. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> spin off. Well, you go ahead and spin that, man. You ready for us? Let's get it. Yeah. Let's go. We we here. Let's go. Let's One, two, it. three, four, five, six, seven, Let's eight, nine. nine. It's, it's the, the ten, ten tax commandments. commandments. What? <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, man. Take Are it you over. Want me to go? Yeah, right. yeah. Let's get it. Yo, I've been in this game for years. It made me an animal, there's rules to this code I wrote me a manual, a step-by-step booklet for you to get Your game on track, the feds off your back Rule number uno, let the IRS know How much dough you hold, cause you know Evasion breeds penalties, especially if that prep messed up Watch your tax go up Number two, document expenses you could prove Don't you know them boys treat lying like violence Take it from your highness Man, I'd have seen mad cats and chits cut for their skins and tricks Number three, go form an LLC A lawyer set that up Properly draft up d in the state up Yep, for them big bucks They'll get that paperwork cleaned up Word up Number four, I know you heard this before Always rely on your CPA guy number five. Never tax prep where you rest at. I don't care if they do it free. Tell them lead number six. That's has advanced credit. Dead it. You think they're doing you a favor? Forget it. Seven. This rule is so underrated. Keep your personal and business completely separated. Business and blood don't mix like politics with no tricks. Find your business serious risk. Number eight. Know the date your taxes due. If you miss the deadline, they'll be coming for you. Number nine should have been number one to me. If you start a business, stay away from hobbies. If they thinking it's a hobby, they ain't trying to listen. You'll be stressing in the kitchen when them letters start hitting number 10. A strong word, corporation, strictly for biz men, not for fresh men. If you ain't got investors, then say hell no, because they gonna want your money, rain, sleet, hell, That's snow. Slow. Follow these rules, you have mad bread to break up. If not, 24 years on the wake up. Flow hit your tempo, watch your frame shake up. Care take a digit maker when you pass. My bad, I hope you rake up a lot of cash with beachfront in Jamaica with the Michelin star chef to hook a steak up. Gotta go, gotta go, more returns to make up. Word up, tax king. Woo! <laughs> there it is. Yeah. There it is. You. Yes, yeah. Sir. Hey, that, that's that's different. That's different, Appreciate man. You, I didn't seen it a couple times, but man, we are glad to have it on First Generation Wealth oh, Builders. Absolutely, man. yeah. That was a pleasure, bro. There it is, man. <laughs> Thank you for coming by, man. Thank you for coming by, man. But before before you leave, what tip can you give any investor that's important for them, you know, to, to take out of this podcast to move forward and apply? Yeah, the biggest the biggest thing I want you guys to take away is taking these this tax thing seriously, making sure that you're working with a professional that's going to help you proactively save money on taxes. Really, when it comes to taxes, there's several th- taxes that we talked about, right? You got income tax, sales tax, capital gains tax, property tax, estate tax, right? But the biggest tax of them all is ignorance tax. Mm. And that's the tax that you pay by not knowing how to proactively save money on taxes, right? You end up overpaying in taxes, you could lose your business, you get fines and penalties. So just taking this information seriously, applying it, you know what I mean? I dropped a lot of gems, some real practical things that you could do today. Also make sure you tap in working with that professional that's gonna help you get on point because really, at the end of the day, it's not how much you earn, it's how much you keep. And if you have nothing to keep, you have nothing to pass down. So. That's all I got to say. That's it. That's all. So That's love. Ball. That's love. No How doubt. can I get in touch with you? Yes, sir. Uh, hit me up. I'm on all social media platforms. Most social media platforms at Michelle Valbrun, M-I-C-H-E-L-V-A-L-B-R-U-N. Um, crazy active on Instagram. And yeah, just definitely tap in. And that's and then also check out the course, uh, taxwealth101.com. 
Go ahead and cop that. That's that's. We're gonna put a link below. For okay, you. perfect. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. yep, yep. So it's super, and I made it super affordable, really, because I really want people to get this information. It's really not about the money for me, for as as it relates to getting this information out there. Obviously, on the one on one, that takes up my time. But as far as giving you guys content information, y'all can have that because I want to make sure our people are, you know, straight and tight with with taxes. Man, that's love. I appreciate you, man. And to you, I appreciate you guys for tapping into another episode of First Generation Wealth Builders, man. Tell a friend to tell a friend. This is where it goes down, man. Each and every week with hot guests and basically dope people doing great things in the industry. And we're just kind of like acknowledging their relationship with real estate. Thank you, man, and have a good day.